Watch this. Right now, we're at a bit of a stalemate. They had a chance to fix it last session and didn't. They still had a chance to fix it this week and won't. I know lawmakers can't seem to agree on how to reinstate a presidential primary. Looks like the Republican Party is caught on a caucus. This is not the way that we educate the public. Uh, this is fear-mongering at its worst. Words matter. And in Dr. Ryan Cole's medical license hearing in Washington, what he said during the pandemic and its impact on the public was the focus of the day. Some people go with garden gnomes. Others, maybe metal sculptures. You know what might be bringing up the rear on the list of how to decorate your yard? How about a caboose? And how about stopping by for a sleepover? Will they or won't they? Will Idaho's legislatures, legislature, I should say, call themselves back into session to clean up the presidential primary mess they made last session? Well, we learned today, they won't. In an attempt to save the state nearly $3 million, lawmakers got rid of all March elections last session, but they failed to realize that also meant goodbye to a possibility of a March or even May presidential primary. The try to fix that mistake vanished as quickly as it took House State Affairs Committee chairman to say, that's it, I made my decision. So the state Republican Party decided this summer to move toward a March caucus to pick a president in 2024. And that was the plan, unless House and Senate members could agree to another plan to fix it in a special session. And that agreement had to happen this week. Joe Paris explains why it won't happen. Behind the scenes at the Idaho State House, lawmakers tell me there's been evolving conversations about having a special session to address the presidential preference primary situation. You might have heard a new Idaho law inadvertently eliminated the presidential primary because of technical errors. An effort to fix that late in the session failed. So the current situation allows for political parties to create their own system to nominate a presidential candidate. The Idaho GOP announced following their convention in June that they're moving to a firehouse caucus, which creates GOP caucuses all around the state on March 2nd, 2024. Right now, we're at a bit of a stalemate. In a quickly evolving situation, House Majority Leader Representative Megan Blanksma details the dynamic between the House and Senate. We have two different petitions that conflict with each other. One's from the Senate, and they have 60% of the senators on that petition, and one's from the House, and there are 60% of the House members on that petition. To summarize, the Idaho House petition supports a March primary format option for political parties. The ballot would only include the presidential preference vote, and that would come at the cost of about $3 million every four years. The Idaho Senate petition supports putting the presidential preference primary on the May ballot. And that 60% number is what's needed for each legislative body to call themselves back. But it needs to be 60% on one petition, not two efforts. And on top of that, the clock is ticking. We're trying to figure out with the state party what that clock really means. We're told that there is an October 1st decision point with the National Republican Party as to um, our state party deciding how they are going to select presidential delegates. That's what this is about. This is about selecting presidential delegates. It sounds like it's a fairly hard deadline. It's from the Republican National Committee. Uh, and that's part of their rules that they have to know what the state's going to do by October 1. And we're being told other states are trying to make some changes and do some things and that they're not going to allow those. And uh, it's my understanding they've already told uh, uh, the Idaho party that they can't do a, a caucus without losing delegates. Senate pro tem Senator Chuck Winder highlights the tricky landscape of the situation. Travel of lawmakers is certainly a consideration. Uh, well, it's certainly not going to happen this week, I don't think. Um, just to, even if we could come to some agreement, it takes time to get the petition signed on both sides and, and get it organized and give people proper notice so they can get to town and all that. So I don't think anything's going to happen this week. Winder, like other lawmakers, point to a key point in all of this. The Idaho GOP can basically do whatever they want, regardless of any action lawmakers take. For example, even if we did move the primary back to March, they may want to just have the caucus because they can control that more than they can, you know, the general electorate coming in to, to vote. So I don't know. Uh, I haven't heard that directly from anyone in the party, but that's one of the things that, that's stirring around out there is even if we did the presidential primary in March, uh, they still might do a caucus. Idaho lawmakers will be back in session in about three months, and at that point, 
there are a lot more options. Well, in January, we can do anything, right? If, if we wanted to consolidate all the elections and have them in January, I, I mean, I suppose we could do that. So, so there's always options once we get to January. And, and the, the special sessions, these extraordinary sessions, they're expensive. And, and you want to make sure that you have everything lined out. And clearly, with two dueling petitions, we still have some things to work out. So maybe we get it done in the next couple of days and we come back. But right now, we're still in a little bit of limbo. You never know. I thought I would have told you, and I think I did tell you, when you asked uh, Thursday, I thought we were, weren't going to make 60 in the House. And then over the weekend, we managed to move to 60 in the House. So. So as uh, Representative Langsma highlighted there at the end, things change very quickly. I did want to mention, though, as a part of this story, we heard a lot from Republicans. Idaho Democrats, they also put out a statement this week calling for the majority party to basically figure it out. The Dems have said that they want to do a primary election format, not a caucus. And Brian, at this point, it, it really is a case of something has to give or nothing happens at all. And it, it kind of seems like we're deadlocked at this point. But um, well, even, even in, in this afternoon, I'm hearing, you know, there's still conversations going. Representative Langsma said it could happen in the next couple of days, but likely it won't because they got to do it before Saturday or mm -hmm. Sunday, which is October 1st. So that's likely not going to happen. They got two days to get everybody together from all around the state. And is it true if they do hold a caucus, there will no longer be 32 delegates from Idaho to the Republican National Convention? I think there's a lot of conversations going on right now between the national GOP and local GOPs, not just in Idaho. There are some rule changes at the party level, uh, at the national party level, that I know that they're still trying to work out. So as you heard uh, Chuck Winder talk about there, it's possible that a lot of this could look different look moving forward. Still more to come. All right, oh, thanks, yes. Joe. Always is. What I'm saying is that we had a lot of people dying out there, and as I mentioned, the overwhelming majority of those people were unvaccinated. And you attribute that to Dr. Cole. You blame Dr. Cole for that. It, in part, he is contributing to that. Day two of the Dr. Ryan Cole hearing in front of the Washington Medical Commission at the board, that is, which is considering his license to practice medicine in Washington. These proceedings came about after a complaint letter from Dr. David Pate, the former CEO of St. Luke's Health System and member of Idaho's Coronavirus Task Force. That was sent to the American Board of Pathology. Well, that group and several others, including Dr. Pate, alleged Dr. Cole, a pathologist based in Garden City, was spreading misinformation, disinformation, and they also accused him of offering medical advice and treatment for COVID-19 that was below the standard of care. Washington is one of the several states where Dr. Cole is certified to practice medicine. Dr. Pate began his testimony yesterday talking about the growing animosity toward Dr. Cole from within the local medical community. And based on things like what he would say in July of 2021 at America's Frontline Doctors White Coat Summit. They don't want you to see what we're seeing. In the laboratory, I have, a, I have the tissues of a dead man on the back of my desk. I have two more coming next week. Guess what? Couple days after a shot, 50 year old healthy triathlete. One of my favorite surgeons in town that I worked with, second shot, mountain biking gone. The surgeon's spouse, a, a physician herself, I think um, found this particularly uh, unconscionable uh, to make that assertion. And uh, she had indicated that in fact, uh, he had not just gotten the vaccine and then uh, with the clink of the fingers died, but rather had completed his vaccine series six months previously and that his death was unrelated. Well, just one of the many falsehoods that Dr. Ryan Cole was purporting across the world over the last several years. Dr. Pate then testified Attorney General Raul Labrador. Then he was just a politician on the Central District Health Board, but Raul Labrador facilitated a meeting between himself and Dr. Cole at the end of September of 2021 with Dr. Pate, I should say, with the intention of trying to rehab Dr. Cole's reputation. Three men got together and Dr. Pate said he was willing to help if Dr. Cole was sincere. In fact, though, Dr. Cole had shown a good faith effort to rehab his reputation. If he did, well, Dr. Pate said he would have withdrawn his complaint and not testified against him. That did not happen. What did happen Dr. Pate says was Dr. Cole doubling down on his factless claims when it came to COVID and the vaccine, showing up at conferences around the world and on podcasts and in interviews, saying a lot of the same thing he was saying in the summer of 2021. This is a poisonous attack on our population, and it needs to stop now. Do words matter, and how were words affecting what was going on? Yes. 
<clears throat> words do matter. People can misspeak. People can say something in 2020 that then changes and is proven different in 2021. You acknowledge that, you correct it, but we never heard him correct these things. And the things that he was saying weren't even uh, true. I think the medical community was outraged when he made assertions of the 20 fold increase in cancers that he was seeing in his lab, yet wouldn't come forward about it. I started seeing endometrial cancers go up and other certain type melanomas I started seeing thicker and earlier as well. If he was correct about that, if he had published a paper about that, a case, case study, anything, he likely would have been famous in the medical community. Why? Number one, it would have been the first time a vaccine has been shown to cause cancer. That would be revolutionary. I and mean, the fact that he would not publish it or even let anybody else confirm it, it was so frustrating for the healthcare community. Well, at one point this afternoon, Dr. Cole's attorney tried to ask for a new hearing altogether after a psychiatrist testified about the impact these misleading statements and outright lies were having on the public. It wasn't just a doctor exercising his right to free speech, she said. This psychiatrist mentioned studies showing 98% of people trusted doctors, and she made mention of Donald Trump and the Koch brothers. And Dr. Cole's lawyer, that'd be Eagle attorney Nancy Garrett, said the whole case was getting too broad, and she tried to have the whole testimony stricken from the record. Both motions were denied, and it continues right now, and that hearing is expected to continue tomorrow. All right, well, sometimes we hit you with the harder news happening around the 208, but today our 411 is all about jobs, hobbies, and dogs. Here's Abby Davis with the 411. Looking for a job? Well, more than 50 companies are looking for employees to fill hundreds of jobs at the Idaho Job and Career Fair in Meridian tomorrow. Head on over to the Galaxy Event Center from 10 to 2, ready to interview and with multiple resumes in hand. You can explore a variety of openings, ranging from manufacturing to healthcare and so much more. It's free for all. Just pre-register online at IdahoCareerFair.com. Oh, and don't forget to dress to impress. Temperatures are falling and pumpkin spice is everywhere, so why not skip ahead and start thinking about winter? Skiers and boarders rejoice because Brundage Mountain announced a new high-speed lift coming to the mountain this winter season. The speedy six-minute base to Summit Quad Chair is replacing the 32-year-old 16-minute Centennial Triple Chair. It's called the Centennial Express, not the most creative name, but it will get the job done 10 minutes faster. So now it will be easier to use the mountain's 1,920 acres of terrain. Our huskies really outnumber the rest of our dogs. Remember that? Last week, our Jude Binkley told you all about how a local animal shelter had 23 huskies. But there's good news. You all must have listened because the West Valley Humane Society says 17 of them have found their forever homes. The Humane Society says they are over the moon with gratitude for the support they've gotten from the community. And it's not too late for you to become a husky parent. There are still six Huskies up for adoption for only $5 through the end of the month. Head on over and become a Husky hero. And that's the 411 on the 208. I'm Abby Davis. There isn't a train track anywhere nearby, but that didn't stop this caboose from calling this Boise neighborhood home. And you might be able to call it home for at least one night. Maybe there's something odd in your neighbor's front yard you want to tell us about. Of course, you got to send us pictures. Or maybe you just want to talk about anything here on the 208. Text it to us. The number is on your screen, 208-321-5614. Don't forget your name and the hashtag, the 208. We like them clean. We like them concise. Oh, and clever. Yeah, that helps. That way, we'll be more likely to show it at the end of the show.
You know, landmarks become landmarks in a variety of ways. For some, it's because of their historical value. Others, because, well, it just stands out. Well, there's one such contender for a West Boise Way post that may fill both those bills, and many of you may have seen it already. People in one Boise neighborhood say they got a new eye catcher in what seemed like overnight. Well, it's been a few months, but it is seemingly out of place. Maybe they just didn't notice it. I mean, sometimes your train of thought just takes you... Look, there's a caboose, but it's not on the loose. It is firmly planted on Whitewater Boulevard. Andrew Bartline, well, he tracks down why. It's one of those neighborhoods that longtime residents lose count of the changes. That street wasn't there, for starters. Uh, either was the park. It used to be an old quarry, so <laughs> that says something. Where Whitewater meets Woodlawn, they're on track for a new fold in the fabric. <laughs> Probably get distracted, be like, why is there a train there? <laughs> I don't know. In the back of the collective mind among the Woodlawn locals, Leo mindset. Peregrina um, shows us his best Sherlock Holmes. I don't know, I kind of like the quirkiness of it. They put the train tracks down like months before and then like the caboose appeared randomly. It was really weird. Months? Uh, it said June 27th. But I was like, wait a minute, that's not normal. <laughs> Serendipity rarely is. Because like you can't just like push it on, obviously. I have no idea. Leo's on the right track. Kind of a long story. But we'd rather hear it straight from the brakeman's mouth. She's always wanted trains and Michael Blood. It was, I kind of gave it to her as a gift and she didn't know anything about it while I was looking for the caboose. I, I purchased it from a Yonke machine shop down in Southeast Boise. Parked now in a side lot. Perfect small slice of land. Behind their current Airbnb listing. You built those railroad tracks? That, that's correct. Uh, we, we built them. Where do you learn to do something like that? You just had to figure it out. The internet? Uh, no, the internet doesn't have anything like that. And there's no nobody who builds those by hand anymore. It's all done by large machinery. They used a fair share of that too. Yeah, you can't just like roll this thing up from the street, huh? No, 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 no. It took a lot more work than that. Do you think they're functional? I mean, they put a train on it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I want to go pushing on it. It's a labor of love. I suppose so, sure. For Michael's love. It is expensive yard art. Janae. So my whole family's kind of been in the train industry for as long as anyone can remember. Every family reunion we sang, I've been working on the railroad. Fitting now, their caboose played a historic role for those who worked on the train cars. This particular one was actually a crew car, so it had quarters for the crew to sleep in, and then they maintain the train from the caboose. Their focus is on preservation today. One date night on a Tuesday night, we started the paint. Bringing the rear end up to the forefront. Definitely shine like a jewel sooner than later. A couple date nights down the line till the red coat completely covers the car. But in no time, already on track for local landmark status. Yeah, given directions will be real easy now. If you get to the train, you've gone too far. I've never thought of that, actually. That would be really smart. <laughs> the couple's not positive what they will do with the caboose exactly. They say the inside right now is completely gutted, and since it's right next door to their current Airbnb listing, they're flirting with the idea of making this a short-term rental, but they don't seem completely married to that idea quite yet. Michael says the cost, Brian, if you're wondering, he says it's uh. similar to a tiny house. He didn't want to give us a dollar figure, but I imagine he loves his wife very much if he's buying her a train. I, absolutely. I think there are some people watching this story or in that neighborhood who said, if you get to the train, yes, you've gone too far. If that's what we're decorating <laughs> yards worth with, yeah. you've gone too far. But no, it's, it's, a, it's a novel idea for exactly. And then turning it into the red caboose is a great idea. Yeah, well, they also said that uh, while they're flirting with ideas of what they want to do with it, they want to know what the viewers think of it. Ah. So that whole text thing, you do that on the show, right? Yep, yep, just send it right to us. Perfect. Let us know what they should do with the caboose. They want to hear from you. Better idea than maybe spending the night in it.
We'll see. Coffee shop. Gorgeous sunset captured in McCall. We've had some beautiful sunrises and sunsets the last couple of days. It'll be another beautiful sunset tonight. Not much cloud cover out there, though, to lend to the drama. Mostly clear skies in Boise right now. 78 degrees, a very pleasant Tuesday afternoon. We've been up to 79. That might end up being our official high for today. And those northerly winds at 10 miles per hour, not quite as blustery or nearly as warm as the southerly wind yesterday that helped drive our temperatures up near 90 degrees. All of that is long gone. We are very much in the fall season and you will know it as the week progresses as temperatures will cool each and every afternoon. We did have a cool front that came through today. That's the first in a series of pushes of cold air all being pumped in by this big, broad, low pressure system. So another one comes in tomorrow. We'll drop another eight to 10 degrees tomorrow afternoon and then we'll continue to cool all the way through the weekend. Not a lot of precipitation coming our way in the Treasure Valley, but by tomorrow, a couple of sprinkles possible in the lower Treasure Valley and then some more rain possible in the West Central Mountains. But overnight tonight, we'll stay clear and cool. 50 degrees by tomorrow morning in Boise. Our high temperature only about 70 degrees with northwest winds tomorrow. 10 to 15 miles per hour highs will generally, like I said, cool anywhere from 8 to 10 degrees compared to today. We don't stop there, though. Upper 60s with some sunshine on Thursday. But by the weekend, we will struggle to get to 60 degrees with some showers popping up each and every afternoon from Saturday through Monday.
All right, we got several comments today about what the GOP, Idaho's GOP, is doing to itself, lawmakers, and the party itself. Our legislature is very good at procrastination and getting themselves in a pickle, says Kurt in Boise. Meanwhile, it's like watching a Monty Python sketch, seeing the Republicans paint themselves in a corner, then devour their own, says Tam. Got this question, too. Uh, we'll leave it to the GOP to keep all Idahoans from voting. And why hasn't Brad Little called for a special session if it's needed? Uh, Larry asked that question. Here's how this works. The legislature allowed themselves to call themselves back into session a couple of years ago. And this, how this works is if they don't have any a good idea, they can't just go in and kind of hang out for three days trying to figure it out. They want to have an idea of what they're going to talk about and how they're going to settle it when they go in to save you money. So that's why he's not calling a session because there's not really any agreement on what they're going to talk about, which is why they're not calling a session in the first place. I don't know.